Hey guys, welcome to Tyson's Fitness Tips Podcast. If you want to lose weight, increase your energy, improve your health and fitness, and look your best, then you have come to the right place. My name is Tyson Brown. I'm a personal trainer, and my job is to help you transform your body by sharing with you the most up-to-date information on health and fitness. I'm going to distill it all down for you into bite-sized, actionable steps that you can take immediately to see results quickly. Now, every Tuesday and Thursday, you can expect a brand new episode, which will be a mixture of interviews with top experts from around the world in the fitness space, and as well as solo episodes from myself, sharing with you exactly what action steps you need to take to transform your health, your body, and your life. And that means you are going to get information from all different areas in regards to mindset, nutrition, fitness, things you wouldn't even think that are associated with your health and fitness, but are going to blow your mind. So let's get into the episode. Hey, before we get into the episode, I just want to let you know my brand new book, Ditch the Diet, has just come out and I'm giving away a couple of free copies. So if you want to go into the draw to win a free copy, all you have to do is share this podcast on your Instagram. All you have to do is click the share button, go to Instagram, put it in your stories, and then tag at Tyson the Trainer, and you'll go in the running. All winners will get the free copy of my book sent straight to your door, and I'm telling you, this book will be a game changer. So that's once again, all you have to do is make sure that you take a screenshot, you share this, and you tag me on Instagram, and you will go into the running. All right, let's get into the episode. Try and we can get started if you want. Sounds good, man. Cool. What's going on, guys? It is Tyson Brown here, back with another episode of Tyson's Fitness Tips. Now, today, I decided that I want to talk something a little bit different about fitness, but it does intertwine with it because what I find is when people start taking care of their health and fitness more and they start to, you know, just invest a little bit more in themselves, they kind of stumble on this building block of self-development and productivity. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring on Mark today because he knows a lot about this shit and he's been talking about it for years. So, I thought this would be the perfect guy to bring on to talk more about it because he doesn't just... He's not like every other productivity person, you know, they, they're very like, uh, how do we say, boring, I'm just going to say it, when, it, when it comes to talking about those yeah. things, but but the way that Mark puts a spin on it, the way that he writes, the way that he talks, I really, really like it, so uh, this is Mark Fisher from Mark Fisher Fitness. Mark, I really appreciate you coming on today, thank you so much for, yeah, coming on. Thanks for having me, man. So, Mark, can you give us a bit of an idea? Because you obviously did start out in like you know the fitness space. Can you give us a bit of an idea about your background and kind of where you've come from? Yeah, I think the the circuitous path that has led us here probably began in undergrad or the going to college. I got a degree in the musical theater, hilariously. Then I spent my twenties working as a professional actor as well as working a side gig. I did a number of painful side gigs over the years. And like many actors, I got into fitness because I wanted to work on my own fitness. And over time, that became the thing I most enjoyed doing on the side. And then slowly that became my mistress that I left acting for. Then over a period of several years, I grew a very big following in New York City working largely with actors and Broadway performers. Then we opened up a physical facility, Mark Fisher Fitness, which is two brick and mortar gyms here in New York, then spent several more years growing that. And then over the period of growing Mark Fisher Fitness, I discovered I had an interest and a talent and a passion for business broadly and really everything that that implies from marketing to customer service to building a team to time management, which I know some will be talking about today. And in the past several years, I have now set up my life so that I split my time about half and half between running Mark Fisher Fitness and working with our leadership team to help them run the day to day. And then half my time is spent speaking and coaching and traveling and working on helping people kick butt at their business. That's pretty cool that you came to that discovery. And like a lot of people think that They've got to find their passion. They've got to find something when they're really young. But people can discover different things in all, like, you know, different times of your life. And I guess it kind of just, 
you know, what your environment's around and kind of what you just jump into. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's interesting because in theory, on the one hand, you have a time advantage if you get started earlier. But I probably would say it's somewhat akin to specializing too early in sports. I don't think it's wrong to go deep from the age of 16. And there's probably something to be said for the mastery one can develop when you start on the path at that age. And it might be fair critique of me to say I will never reach the level of mastery that some people have at a skill that they've been hammering away for 20 years at. But because of my background, particularly with the liberal arts education, I think that is exactly why I've had the success that I've had and have been able to, quite frankly, outpace a lot of people because my brain has a weird brazing in a very unique background. And I think that's allowed me to have a different approach to all the things that I've done. Now, something I know that we'll probably chat about a little bit today to my credit, I do think I've gone aggressively deep as fast as I can on many things. So because of the borderline obsessiveness of my educational processes, I think I've been able to also make up for a lot of time. And I think I'm a pretty proficient learner in general. But I think it's interesting because it's, it is accurate. I didn't really start getting into business really until my 30s. I mean, when I was 30 years old, I still essentially taken a vow of poverty and was expecting to spend my life as an actor doing some training on the side. But I think it was that life experience as an artist and as a student of philosophy and psychology that I was able to go deep on and bring with me into the work that I do, both in Mark Fisher Fitness and with Business for Unicorns, which is the business that I do my coaching and consulting under. Hmm, That's interesting. It's kind of a good reminder too, like for me, because, you know, being 24, it's like, oh, like, I've got so much time ahead of me, but at the same time, it, it, you know, it's a good reminder for you saying, you know, you didn't pick this up till oh, 30 yeah. and I'm like, I've got plenty of time to be able to take, like do things that I actually want to do and discover more about myself. For sure. And it's tough too, because I would never necessarily recommend someone be like, if someone is 30 and rudderless, I, I don't know that that's the best thing. <laughs> if someone's 30 years old and they really have no clue what they're doing with their life, you know, it's interesting because I, you know, can't say I was out I was without existential dread at that point in my life and thinking, oh my gosh, is this going to be it? Am I going to be just living from paycheck to paycheck till I'm 40 and never retiring? However, it has worked out well for me. And I think your point is well taken for anyone listening that is on the younger side. You know, 24 years old, at least for me, it's a real special kind of misery because you've really had such a brief time to be an adult. So everything feels like it's very, very meaningful and feels very rushed because you just don't have the luxury yet of being able to look back at the way the dots connect. And there is that famous, of course, Steve Jobs, I believe it was a commencement speech he gave talking about how the the dots don't make sense until you look back retroactively. Um, And like I said, I'm choosing my words carousel here because again, I would never want to encourage someone to be rudderless. And I don't think anyone would have ever said that I was rudderless, but I do have to say, I feel very grateful for the winding path that brought me here because I think it's made me much more effective at what I do now and has given me a background, frankly, that really differentiates me from a lot of other people that do the work that I do. Definitely differentiates you for sure. Like, you know, being able to see, you know, you're a man of many talents that we can say. Um, and that's, I guess, what resonates with a lot of people too. Like being able to see like, you know, you don't have to be so one single focused in one specific area. Definitely. And I am certainly... The first to admit I am a massive generalist. I think, frankly, if the goal really is entrepreneurship, there's something to be said for that because there's not a lot of things I want to do the day to day on anyway. I just need to know enough about all of the things to hire and manage and develop people. And my main interest beyond any individual skill set is metacognition or thinking about thinking. My main interest is. How do I come, number one, more effective at learning faster and more thoroughly? And number two, how to become better at thinking critically so that I can overcome my own cognitive biases, get very clear on what reality actually is, and then make good choices based on reality that will move me in the direction of my preferred outcomes. That is uh, super high up there when it comes to those type of things. Like, and I think, and I think people for, like for the people who are just kind of 
starting to get into this area. Like, I, I feel like once they start taking care of their health, they start seeing other areas of their life where they can develop, you know, work, uh, productivity, sure. relationships, all these areas. And, um, hundred percent. And when, when it comes to you, like, like for self development, like, you know, developing yourself as a person, what does that mean to you? Cause surely it's not just, you know, working just on business or working just on the fitness side of things. I'm sure there's right. a big meaning for it for you. Yeah. I think I'm interested in discovering how I can, and this is cliche. And I think it's probably the case for everyone, but number one, how do I develop my particular talents and skill sets both mitigating my weaknesses, but importantly, leveraging my innate superpowers to their full impact. And how do I do so in a way that maximizes my ability to serve the communities that I feel called to serve? So the lens I always look at it in is for me, fulfillment, and this isn't meant to be prescriptive. I'm not saying this is like the way one should live their life. But for me, it is on the one hand, I want to be a student. And on the other hand, I want to be a servant. And I want to be a student because I can't be an effective servant unless I've actually gotten good at things. So I need to study myself. I need to study the world. I do need to develop domain expertises at certain areas of expertise. I do need to develop certain skill sets because ultimately that's going to allow me to be a more effective servant. And on the one hand, if we were being very utilitarian about it, We might say part of the benefit of that is the market will value me more highly because I can do things more effectively than other people can, but I am not over here counting papers. And for me, I am more interested in the piece that hopefully correlates with financial outcomes, which is that hopefully I am positively maximizing the impact I can have to ease the suffering of others and improve the quality of life for the world around me during my brief time on this planet before I kick it. Because something I think a lot about is ethics. I think a lot about moral reasoning. And I think any honest person has to start with the dark knowledge that by dint of being a human, you will do things that will negatively impact the world around you. First of all, you're going to have a carbon footprint. You're going to inevitably be part of certain systems and structures of society that are having a negative impact on the world around you and on the planet. You are going to have acute moments where you say something thoughtless to your mom or you hurt a friend's feelings. So if we're starting knowing that inevitably we're going to have missteps, and if we can come at that with compassion and forgive ourselves, for me, then the equation is how do I maximize the positive impact so I have the maximum positive net impact? Because I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm going to have some negative impact at times. So how do I maximize the net positive impact I have on the planet so that when I die – I know that I nudged the ball forward and I hopefully left the world and I left humanity a little bit better for having been here. I, th- I think this all sounds very serious. <laughs> no, no. Usually I'm a lot more fun than this. I should curse more, I guess. But, but you are really getting to the heart of, I think, my certain personal mission and I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about this, Tyson. So thank you for leading me down this trail of breadcrumbs. Well, it's actually very cool because, like, as much as I want to do dive down this deep, like, I, don't, I know it's a deep hole, and to hear, you know, what your mission is, it also selfishly does help me think more about how I can develop myself as a person, you know, what is driving me, and how can I leave a better impact, because I think that's what we're all here to do, like, is to, we, I assume most people want to leave the world better, in a better place, but... Also knowing that yeah. is that you will have like we are human, right? So there will be mistakes that come up, we will have error and we we just are fatal to that. So being able to accept that but then thinking, okay, these are mistakes I'm going to make, but what can I do to either negate them or to make sure that the impact that I'm leaving will uh will outweigh the mistakes that are made? Because as much like you know, the the effect that we have on the world making the bad choices can be easily outweighed by good choices if we consciously make them and just think about how we can always be improving on that side of things too. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. And I think that, you know, I've obviously thought a lot about this, a great deal about all of this. Um, And, you know, it seems to me it's almost akin, again, to running a business in that you're just you're going to make mistakes and you want to do everything in your power to avoid that. So I want to be clear, I'm neither fetishizing mistakes nor am I saying that one should be cavalier about having these missteps. 
more to the point, and this is me, I guess, probably coaching myself and perhaps some of our listeners as somebody that can struggle with perfectionism, particularly because I have very high personal standards for myself and just making it be like, it's just going to be okay. Like it's not going to be perfect. All or nothing thinking is never helpful. Just start with where you are, use what you have and do your best to make a difference and, and you know, improve the world around you as best you can. And I think, like you said, that's that's an every area. Pardon me, every area of your life. You know, if it's fitness, like, yeah, you know, you might you're trying to lose weight, you're trying to get to a goal, and there are going to be missteps along the way. But you don't go, oh well, that's another mistake. Like that's going to be fine. You make the mistake, and you think, what can I learn from this? How can I apply it to try and avoid that mistake in the future? Yeah. But you're never going to always completely avoid those mistakes too. It's just taking that time to acknowledge what you did and think, can I make an improvement to avoid this in the future? Yeah, for sure. And the reality is, I think there's also an element, and this is a little bit, I suppose, contrary to a lot of very aggressive, create your own reality, personal development stuff, a lot of which I resonate with, and I think there's value in. But I think luck is not probably given the credit that should for things going well and things going badly. I think randomness, unfortunately, is part of the universe. Now, it's probably not useful to dwell on it because by definition, randomness are things that are not in your control. So it makes sense, if you're thinking purely strategically, to focus on the things that you can have control over. But of course, there is an element of luck in all of this, and that's why I think anyone who's intellectually serious has to approach attempting to live a good life with a large, heaping, steaming serving of humility. I think it's a really good point. Um, it, it got, like in regards to that. So, uh, going down the, the self development journey, like when did you? I guess you've kind of always been doing it, but like when did you start to become more conscious of like, oh, you know, I'm actually going to make a conceited effort to read more books to start developing myself as a person more. Like, what kind of led you down that road? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. I think the funny, funnily enough, the very first book I can remember reading that was broadly at all in the world of personal development was the book Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Uh, probably heard it. I'm sure many people listening have heard of this. And that book definitely changed my life in very real and palpable ways. So I read that when I was 22 years old. It was the fall after I graduated college. And I read it ostensibly because a mentor had recommended it. And it's hilarious. At the time, I was like, well, if I read this, I can learn to be more effective for my career. And for some reason, I, I got in my head that if I read Power of Now... I can be more effective master myself and be a better artist and move my career forward, which is not the worst intention, I suppose. But that book broke my head open. I was only 22 at the time, so I hadn't thought a lot about these things. But even the concept of there not being a past or a future, if you ask a tree what time it is, it's, well, it's, it's now. When else would it be? Was very revelatory to me. And I can remember actually crying at points in the book because I just didn't understand until that moment that there literally is only now. There is no past and future. There's only this moment. You will only ever be here now. And that opened up the door for me for a lot of exploration of Eastern spirituality, Eastern mysticism. Because until that point, I was a classic Western society, hyper-driven, Capricorn, gold-driven dude. Not a bad guy by any means, but I just hadn't really thought about that stuff. So I think in many ways, that's where the journey began. I think, frankly, there was a large period through my 20s where I really struggled to integrate that discovery with the goal-oriented side of me. And I think, again, I'm, I don't think I was ever rudderless. I don't think anyone would accuse me of lacking in ambition or setting goals. But as I tried to integrate an acceptance of being where I am now and not constantly striving, it took me several years to put the piece together because that book led me into, as I mentioned, into studies of Eastern spirituality, Eastern mysticism, studying various tenets of New Age thoughts. Then throughout my mid-20s, then I started getting the harder stuff. Then I started studying comparative religion. I started studying classical philosophy. At one point, I actually had applied and was going to go back to school to get a master's in classical philosophy on route to getting a doctorate in social work. I wanted to be a, a, a doctor, of so, do some sort of clinical work. I was very much inspired at that point by Wayne Dyer, to give you some sense if you ever heard of him, who was sort of a new-agey-ish personal development speaker. 
And even there, again, I was really following the thread of personal development. And then the fitness piece always went along with that. I think your point is very cogent that many people see when they experience the outcomes of the inputs of eating right and training right and see their body change. I think that is a doorway to understanding agency for many people. And I think that experience begins to open a possibility to other realms of our life where perhaps these other realms of our life also cause of an effect will play a role and I can do certain things to at least impact the outcomes. So that was really how my 20s played out and then probably right around 30 was an interesting moment because that's when I started reading business books and interestingly enough, I don't think it was around then that I started reading what would be more traditionally qualified as personal development. I had read plenty of self-help, but it's interesting a lot of the business literature is borderline personal development D. I mean, sometimes it's on business tactics, but there's a lot of, I once heard someone say this, I thought this was a really interesting point. When you read leadership books about business, it's often a uh, acceptable way to read about self-help and personal development, but you're not calling it that, you're calling it leadership. So it's almost this sort of Uh, if you will, spirituality without religion kind of approach to how one wants to show up and serve the people that work for you and inspire people to move together in service of a common mission. So it was right around when I was 30 that almost on a whim, I had decided that I wanted to stay in town and really focus on my training career, that I was no longer looking to leave town as an actor. And at the time, my intention was to continue to pursue work in New York City, but pursue TV and film. And I knew this means that I would work less, but it would allow me to be in the city. The work that I would get would be more in line with what I want to do. It would be more lucrative. And I had the opportunity to grow, at the time, what was a nascent embryonic business. And in that summer of 2010, I on a whim, had read some mentor figures saying they read two books a week, and I decided that sounded like a good thing to do. And I was already a very voracious reader at that point, but it was at that time I really committed to rigorous discipline in reading books. At that time, I, of course, was still doing a lot in fitness, so I decided I wanted to read a business book a week and a fitness book a week. I think I was inspired by, if you've ever heard of uh, my good buddy, Eric Cressy, mm-hmm. I think of something, maybe him or Mike Boyle or Alan Cosgrove or someone in the fitness space. And what I did was I just started going through every money I looked up to. And I just started looking at every book they said I should read. And I just started reading all of their books. So anybody who was a mentor figure, if they said read a book, I write down and I would read that book. The other thing related to personal development that happened at this time that looking back on it, I think was important was it was, I read a book called Goals by Brian Tracy because it had been recommended to me by Mike Boyle. Not even directly, this was before, it's funny now because Mike is kind of a friend at the time. I was one of millions of rando people in the industry that <laughs> idolized Mike and we did not yet have a personal relationship. At any rate, that book inspired me to adopt a very rigorous goal setting practice which I have kept to this day, mostly consistently, in that every three months I sit down in a methodical way, I get very clear around what is my five year vision Then after I get clear on that, I work back to, okay, well, what is my one-year vision? And then from there, I begin to chunk back to clarify, okay, well, if that's where I want to be, what skills do I need to be truly world-class at to create that vision? What do I need to master? What do I need to become savagely good at to be worthy and deserve that one-year vision for the life that I want to create for myself? And I think what is notable about this particular process, which I have to credit is is largely adapted from Brian Tracy, is this process has allowed me to periodically pause at once a quarter, get clear on, okay, well, now where do I see myself in five years so I can keep course correcting like a plane flying to the sky to destination? But then importantly, instead of staying at 35,000 feet, I work back to get very granular and clarify what needs to be my educational focus for the next three to 12 months, and then I will hammer it. I will hammer it. And over the past, I guess, eight years since I've been doing that, that's been everything from focusing on management to public speaking to business finance to writing, and I'm just toggling through things I need to get good at. And when I decide I need to get good at something, I will spend three to 24 months on it. I will read as many books as I can find as possible. I will take college courses on it. I will hire coaches. I will let everyone know I'm working on that. 
I will ask for feedback from the people in my sphere as I'm working on those things. And I would just go absolutely nuts for three to 24 months. I just hammer, hammer, hammer. So I get good at the skill set that I need to master to move me towards that goal. And in my experience, and that is a very cliche personal development thing, anybody that's familiar with the space, that's not exactly mind blowing. I think the thing that is perhaps different is frankly just that I did it. And I did it very consistently. Yeah, I mean, it's not enough just to have the dream. You've got to create, well, what do you do? Or as my well, another mentor of mine, John Berardi, would say, I don't know what he says in these words, but I feel like I just homage to him, so I'm sort of <clears throat> adapting something he said before. You start with your dreams, then you turn into a clear vision, then you turn that vision into goals, then you chop up those goals into skills you need to master, and then you turn that skill acquisition into a series of daily habits. And that is as close as I know to an equation to live a successful and impactful life. That's uh, that's fantastic. Like honestly, like what, like as you were talking, I was actually writing down notes. I'm like, oh wow, this is actually really interesting. Like how I can go. Right yeah. So like you know, taking that quarterly time to reflect and think about where you want to go in the future. And I think like I was going to ask you a, a couple of different you know books and things you'd recommend. But one thing that you said there that I think is really important is having a goal set. You know, like where are you going towards, and then putting in those action steps towards where you need to go. So whether it be, like you said, you know, you do five years, but even if someone's like, I can't think five years ahead, like, where do you want to be in a year's time? Where do you want, because you don't yeah. ever want to be in the same place you <laughs> are in a year's time, because that means you just wasted a fucking year of your life, right? Yeah. And it's interesting too, because I, so the first thing I'll say is anybody listening that is interested in learning more about this, they can go to, it's a free article, com. Look up, I think it's called Quick and Dirty Goal Setting System. And they can have like a done for you 30 minute variation. It's not quite to the detail that I do, but it's a pretty good get you started adventure to dig on into. And one of the things that I have learned having done a lot of goal setting work in workshops and with a lot of clients on it over the years is a lot of people understand they're very daunted by five year vision. They feel very, very daunted by it. And that's very normal. So I also want to normalize if anyone's listening to this. And to your point, they're like, oh, but what do I, I don't know, I don't even know what I want to be next week, man. Totally not wrong. I want to say that's absolutely normal. There's nothing wrong with that. And I want to gently push on it because the point that I like to make is you can't guarantee by having a clear five-year vision that you're going to create the life that you want. But it is very unlikely that you will accidentally stumble into your dream life without taking some time to work on this. And just like any other skill set, every master was once a disaster. You're going to get better at it. And not only will you get better at it, but you should expect if you've never done this before, the first time you do it, it will feel awkward and you will objectively be shitty at it. You will objectively be poor at it and you will do a bad job because you've only done it once and you don't know what you're doing. And you're like an adorable little baby lamb just learning to walk and that's adorable. But if you commit to it, if you just do it for 10 years, like three times or four times a year, uh, by like the 40th time you do it, I think you'll find you're pretty <laughs> proficient at it. That's a really good point. Actually, you make this a similar type of point to what I heard uh, Jordan Peterson talks about. And he talks about um, uh, a self-development course that he has. And he does ask you to outline uh, your future goals. And he goes, yeah. And he just says, you're going to be bad at it when you first do it because you've never done it before. Like you can't expect to yeah. have a clear, like, oh, this is exactly what's going to happen. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do that. Like, it's just not how it goes. But like you said, you're, yeah. you're, you're more likely to get somewhere if you have something in place than to just happen to stumble upon it one day and be like, oh, wow, this is fantastic. Like, how the fuck did I get here? I think that that's a good way to do it. And it's interesting doing a lot of work in time management. I'll tell you, you see a very similar phenomenon when someone begins to attempt some level of regimentation and systematic planning, even their daily schedule. So let alone planning out what five years is going to look like, even setting up the day after. So a, a cognitive bias, one of the things our brain is not good at is planning. And it's called planning fallacy. We're very bad at guesstimating how long things will take. And the theory is this is because in the ancestral evolutionary environment, 
that was a useful adaptation because if you know how hard it would be to open up a business or if you really knew how hard it was going to be to renovate your kitchen or you really knew how hard it was going to be to have kids, no one would do any of those things. So we're adapted to be poor at planning. But if you do it on a regular basis, you'll discover that you get better at it. Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but at this point, I've gotten pretty good at setting up my day the night before when I'm planning it all out. I'm I got a good idea about how long things are going to take. Now, am I 100% perfect at all time? No. Do I ever drift? Like every once in a while. But and admittedly, like I'm pretty blessed with some strict discipline superpowers that I have utilized and have worked for me. But I've gotten better at it over the years because I've just gotten a sense of like how long things are going to take. And for me, when I'm thinking about successful time management, your goal is creating games you can win. I might suggest success in life is a matter of creating incremental games that you can win. They don't want to be so hard you can't do it, but so easy that it's boring. And most people, when I look at how they approach time management, part of the issue is they're never playing games they can win because they're so poor at planning fallacy. They're not even attempting to make a to-do list exist in time. They're not analyzing or prioritizing their to-do list in a meaningful way. So they might have an epic brain dump list of all the things that need to happen. But because they've never analyzed it and made that to-do list exist in time, they've never gotten proficient at creating games they can win. So they're not getting the dopamine hit throughout the day at the end of the day. And I I attribute part of my joy at the end of the day is not just that I'm good at this. Part of it is because I'm pathologically happy. So I also want to start up front. I won the genetic lottery in that they estimate 50% of your positive emotion is genetic. And I think like, I'm probably got like 48% of that. I think I really lucked out. It's funny because I wasn't happy for a lot of my life, but that's because my life circumstances were not as good and I had made poor choices. But um, I think I maximized every ounce of my natural ability to be joyful, also through right thinking and studying how to work with my mind and create belief systems that work for me. But at the end of my day, I feel like, ah, like today was today. At the end of the day, I was like, man, I cannot believe how much I got done today. Like, I absolutely crushed it. I crushed everything I planned to do, and I got a little bit extra done. And it's just my dream to help as many people as possible have that feeling because it means I have a great time with my life, and I know many people that feel stressed and that they can't ever get to all the things they want, and that is simply because of planning fallacy. It's not because they have too much to do. None of us are going to get done all the things we could get done, but it's because they don't know how to properly educate what's actually reasonable, and they're not creating games that they can win. So they're not getting that dopamine hit of success. Okay, and so like you uh, like you kind of explained about how you can do that, but like if we were to kind of think about, all right, if we could practically say this, if you wanted to get started just doing this, what's... Uh, like, what's a simple way to start playing that game for yourself to actually get better at it? Or just to yeah. experience what the game is? And you're talking uh, specifically about time management, how let's, to set up a day for success. About, yeah, let's talk about, like, I think yeah. that's a really key point that for people to set up their day of success. Yeah. So the way I look at it, there are a few key principles that are not really up for debate about how one does this. And then there are a cornucopia of methods one can use where you scale the system to the complexity of your life, your personal preferences, et cetera. So when we're zooming out to principles, there needs to be some method whereby which you capture the things that need to happen. You capture thoughts. So there needs to be some sort of document. It could be an analog notebook. It could be an Evernote document, a note on your phone, something where you brain dump. David Allen who is the author of Getting Things Done, which is arguably the most, I think, brilliant time management system out there. And this is a guy who does this professionally, so that's, I hope, meaningful praise, Mr. Allen, not like <laughs> you need it, um, has said that your brain is for having ideas, not for remembering them. And I think that's important. So I think your first principle is you need to create some sort of external brain to get things out of your head on the paper into some system that you trust you will then effectively process it. And that's a key point because if you don't trust that you'll effectively process it, if you're simply writing it down on a piece of paper you're going to lose, that won't give you any mental freedom. And we're looking to relieve ourselves of mental itchiness. In fact, 
there is a proposed theory about why it's so hard to forget about things that you have not gotten done or, importantly, written down and trust you can get done later. And it's called the Zagernik effect. The Zagernik effect, named after the researcher coined it, proposes that your brain is itchy. We don't like open loops. We don't like when there's a thing that we know we need to do. So your brain is going to be itchy unless you're writing things down. And for a lot of people, they spend a lot of their life very distracted because they don't have the organizational skills to get stuff out of their paper into a system they know they can process it later, which means they're not able to be present with the people they're with. And importantly, they're not able, and this is, I theorize, but I think I'm right on this one, they're not able to be creative in the way that other guys would by giving their brain space to do the thing they're doing when they're doing the thing and not thinking about all the other things that they need to do later. So the first method is capture. You have to have some system to capture down. Then, secondly, there, and again, done a number of ways, there needs to be some moment of analyzing those that brain dump, some moment of analyzing all these things you've written down, and that is a transitional step to the third principle, which is transfer to a calendar of some kind. At some point, you have to make your to-do list exist in time. And again, there's many ways you can do that. Now, for most people, just to give you an example of this, my general suggestion for a lot of people is the capture system could be, I personally love an analog notebook, but a lot of people prefer to use a computer text document or Evernote, that's fine, whatever that is. Then the analyze moment ideally happens at the end of each day. So at the end of each day, there should be some moment where you go through your document, you go through your working brain of that day. For me, it's a notebook. And everything gets crossed off by the end of the day. I either do it and get it done if it's a very discreet task, an email I need to do, a book I need to write, a thank you card I'm going to write, whatever. I scratch that off. And the things I can't get done right then when my day is ending then get transferred because I'm now at this analyzed moment. I'm transferring it to a future date. Now, if I, my system, because, again, I need a little bit more sophistication because my life is a little bit more complex than can bear a simple system. I have a number of lists. So a lot of those items might go to a meeting list where I have it organized by the four people that I work with at Mark Fisher Fitness and then with my business partner, Michael. So I'm not battering them with a bunch of like emails or notes or whatever. I save that up to we have our meeting because it's just a more efficient way of doing business. I also have an ongoing project list. So if there's something that I wrote down, let's say I have an idea for a course, that's amazing, or I'm working on a presentation that I have to prepare. Well, I'm not gonna do that in one 30 minute session. So that's not a discrete to do. That goes my ongoing project list. And I keep that separate because those are things that I need to do in more than one discrete 30 minute work module. Then a lot of the other things that I do just need to get scheduled. So a lot of mine are one offs. It could be like follow up with somebody. It could be, you know, finish uh, a blog post. It could be a number of different things. But if I can do it like in a 30 minute thing and I'm going to do it in the next couple of weeks, I just transfer it onto my calendar. Now, again, there's different ways to do that. I personally prefer to use a notebook. Very simple. I use a dumb, boring, like, ringed notebook. So on the right side, it's like a chicken scratch of what I have assigned to do on that day. Then on the left side, the night before, I meticulously create a schedule of what's going to happen, sometimes in 15-minute increments. And then when I get that, I crush. I don't have to think. I just do the thing that I wrote down that I got to do. I'm not wasting any brain power deciding what I'm going to do or thinking about what should I do or hemming and hawing. I just go to town and I start crushing. Now, like I said, some people might do a different method. They might, maybe they want to use a calendar app of some kind. Maybe they like to type in their G calendar. And you can do it in a ton of different ways. But I think the principles that you'll see very consistently if you study very time management systems are number one, you capture the things. Number two, you analyze the thing at some point to prioritize, organize, put into lists. And then three, you transfer into calendar so the to-do list exists in time. To-do lists that don't exist in time are a recipe to be miserable, sad, and insane. Because there's just this list of unwieldy things, and you haven't created a game you can win. So you might say that that entire methodology, which again is not unique to me, any, any time management system you'll study, you'll see will have those particular pillars in place. That is how you create a game you can win, and you set yourself up so you can actually be accomplished with to-do lists. 
I love that. That is awesome. Um, just thinking about that, uh, that like those those three things we've got to do. Uh, one like one thing I, I I figured for myself, but I I don't want people to get stuck or I is like just because you write it all down doesn't mean that every single thing has to get done. Because there's going to be some things where you're like, you know what, you know what, this is not going to happen. Cross it off the list. Or yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Because like I used to be myself. I'm like, how like you said, how am I going to get all this done whenever I can? Like I've got to. But it's like you know what, maybe at this time in your life you don't need to pursue that. So just cross it off because even if you've written it down, it's taken that space out of your brain, and now your brain has that time to be able to be creative, think of something different. It's not being occupied with space, something's in there. Like you said, I the brain is uh, meant for ideas, not to memorize the ideas. Is that right? Yeah, it's so true, and it, it's interesting because if you know, understand the essence of time management, the essence of strategy is what you're not going to do. And time management is largely about saying no and setting boundaries. Now, there's a time and a place for it, depending on where an individual is in their career and their life. There's, you're going to start by having to say yes to everything. But there will come a tipping point where opportunities become aggressively inbound and they're no longer pursued outbound. And you have to begin to change your system. There's an amazing article and video you can find on the Personal Trainer Development Center. Uh, as I mentioned, John Brory is one of my mentors. And he, God love me, such a delightful, weird, magical guy. At one point, there were like eight of us chatting about setting boundaries. And he was like, I would like to do a webinar for you all. I'd like to do a live training for you eight. Let's get together on Zoom. And I'm going to share with you my thought process for how I look at this and my methodology. I was like, this is brilliant. (laughs) And he has a very interesting methodology that if anybody wants to learn more about saying no, I would direct them to. Because one of the points he makes, and I think this nuance is often lost, is you can't start by saying no to everything. And there is... You know, there are these layers. You have to go through these phases of your career and your life. And in the beginning, you're going to be saying yes a lot. But at a certain point, it's largely about what you're not going to do. So another list that I use, and I believe this might have been ripped off getting things done as well, is another one of my lists is my someday list, or what I've taken to call more accurately my not going to do this now list. And that I find commonly satisfying because I can record ideas, business ideas, things I want to get back to that just like, aren't going to happen now that I'm choosing not to do, but I want to get them off the list. I don't want to lose them forever. And I'll admit it's mostly a cognitive trick. I don't review that a whole lot. I probably should do more. I don't know how much, how many things ever escape from the island of someday, but I have found that useful to get things off the list. Yeah. And like you said, like, you know, you may not review it here or there or whatever it is, but like, you know, you've got those ideas stored somewhere. So you don't have to think about like, oh, what was I, you know, what was that thought? It's there. Like one day you're going to come over and be like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. But it's good that you forgot about it because now you have more brain power to do other things. So true. Well, dude, this, uh, I could honestly speak to you about this forever, but what I want to think about now is we've talked about one thing when it comes to time management, you know, you've, you've got those three processes in place. Um, you've talked about a couple, you know, you've talked about, you know, setting, your, setting some goals for the future and there's an article for it. But if we could think about like, you know, uh, one time management book and one goal setting book that they would get started with, would you recommend the goals by Brian Tracy and getting things done by, um, David Allen? Yes, I think that I would. Getting things done is the Bible of time management. It really is the mothership from which all other approaches flow. If there is anything, and this is not a critique of it, what is so masterful about getting things done but can be daunting the first time you dig into it is it is so unbelievably comprehensive, even as far as how one organizes their physical space. However, that is definitely the book to read. And I think the great thing about getting things done, and this is a point that David Allen makes, is what's so amazing about that system is even if you just pick up a couple things, and I am not somebody that's a fan even of the term hacks. However, even though most things in life benefit from developing real systems and processes, what's great about time management is small hinges will swing big doors. So if you read a book like that, even if you pick up just a couple pieces of it, you're going to see a major return on the investment of having to read it because even a little bit increase of efficiency will really compound over time. Because if you, let's say, for instance, you, know, you do the math of it, if you can figure out some way to save even a few minutes of the week over the course of your life and your career, that's going to have a massive impact on your free time. So getting things done is my time match recommendation. I, I probably would recommend the book Goals by Brian Tracy. It is stylistically 
not a perfect values fit for me at this point, but I still have great respect for Brian Tracy, great respect for that book. So it, I, I, and I say that because I suspect some readers might find it a little corny, but I still think there's a lot of value. And I think the methodology he offers in there in many ways is a deep dive of a lot of the things I use with my clients. Uh, another particular exercise he has people do, which I think is very valuable, is making a list of 10 goals for the year. Because most people can do like three to four. And it gets very interesting when you're pushing yourself to get eight, nine, 10, your brain is hurting. Not unlike for anybody listening that writes copy, how you write a bunch of headlines. And you're like, I can't think of it anymore. I can't think of it anymore. And then you think of something gold. So I, I probably would recommend both those books. for If you're interested in time management and personal development, those are great places to start. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Now, where can people find out more about you? So what have you got going on at the moment? I got all the things going on. They can find me freshly on Instagram after a little five-year hiatus. I am back at M Fisher Fitness. They can find me blogging or not blogging, whatever you do, Instagramming. I don't know, whatever you do over there about books and time management and business and fitness. They can also find me at markfisherfitness.com businessforunicorns.com is the place where they'll find information most relevant to today's conversation the markfisherfitness.com is a place for great fitness information if they like their fitness served with a side of existential madness and unicorn hysteria and then they can go to markfisherhumanbeing.com if they want to find my personal hub on the web, that's a list of all the businesses and projects I've got my fingers in, as well as a list of my speaking events uh, and pictures of me doing things, including but not limited to riding a dragon to the cosmos while oiled up wearing a lone cloth, fighting a Twinkie, and wrestling with a giant man chicken. You are definitely a bunch of fun. So, guys, I really do recommend you follow Mark because I've been following <laughs> him for a long time and got the opportunity to meet him this year, which is awesome. So, Mark, thank you so much again for coming on. I've got one more question before you go. What are you diving deep on at the moment? Mm, what am I diving deep on at the moment? You know, I'm still sort of continuing on. This year has been largely about studying writing. Okay. I, and I know we have our friend in common, our good friend, John Romanello, who just like loves and adores writing. And I love and adore Roman. I have zero interest in writing. I really just couldn't care less. I care about communication. So I'm not a student of it artistically the way that Roman is. There's a genuine passion for it. I am grotesquely utilitarian, offensively utilitarian in that I just want to be understood better. And I reluctantly got to the place where I'm crushing through all the, the books that Roman has all you guys read, like Bird by Bird, um, elements of effing style, and really thinking very critically and really just even doing dumb things like uh, excellence in any field of human achievement is mastering the basics. So digging back into something like elements of effing style was just a great review of grammar. I was realizing I was using semicolon somewhat inconsistently. I was using EG sometimes. I was using IE when I meant EG. Um, so it's understanding how to use long hyphens and all that sounds so dumb and might not sound interesting to the reader and frankly, or the listener, frankly, it's not interesting to me at all. I don't care, but the better I am at writing and communicating, the more I can persuade people and teach and educate. So <laughs> this is so funny because that's exactly how I'm like, I just, I'm just going to be utilitarian about this. Like, you know, I have no passion for it, but yeah. being able to be better understood, it's like, well, I've got to do it. Yeah. And I'm passionate about communication. And again, I, I should I should be clear because here's the other thing too. Frankly, frankly, I know that I have a lot. That is a, a realm that I have ta- oodles of talent. Like I'm just lucky. I've always been very naturally talented at speaking and writing and using words to communicate. I've also studied copywriting over the years, which has been sort of that. But I look at someone like Rome, and he's just so passionate about great writing and just passionate about Hemingway and I really I'm really inspired by it. I really look up to it and I really admire it because I don't I don't I, I don't understand I'm just like wow my friend really <laughs> loves this my gosh but I appreciate mastery of any kind I appreciate excellence of anything and I'm probably not looking to write the next great American novel but I am looking to be effective at writing the, an email that is going to help somebody understand what I do in a way that moves into action or a communication that helps ease someone's suffering and is clear and concise and that they can read quickly and it gives them some laugh out laugh ha 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 guffaws that is warm and concise and clear 
And I really value that because in today's day and age, there's so much going on, there's so much to read, and there's so much communication. I think it is a real act of service and generosity to choose to be very good at the communication and learn how to communicate in a way that is clear, simple, concise, warm, and hilarious. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much, man. Like This has been a very, very fun, fun podcast and I really enjoyed it. So, um, guys, that is the end. I'm sorry to say it. I'm hoping I will be able to get Mark on for a part two because this was just so much fun. Thank you so much, buddy. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening to the episode. I really appreciate it. Now, before you go, can you please do me one favor and go to the iTunes review and leave me a five-star rating? That way it's going to help me reach more people with their health and fitness. And if you do that, whoever leaves a five-star rating, I'll give you a free copy of my digital book. So all you have to do is just go get a five-star, screenshot it, send it to me via Instagram at TysonTheTrainer and you'll get a free copy of my digital book. Thank you so much and I'll speak to you next time.